Hello. This week, extraordinary scenes from two great democracies. India's Narendra Modi showered in rose petals after winning the mandate of millions and Britain's Theresa May anguished and alone in Downing Street as she made her farewell speech. The fickleness of power. My guests this week, Ashis Ray of Ray Media, Janet Daly of the Sunday Telegraph, French Algerian writer Nabila Ramdani and Striker Maguire of Bloomberg Markets. Thank you all for joining us. So, thank you, India, said Narendra Modi last week. He just won an increased parliamentary majority in the world's largest democracy. So, how did he manage this miracle? And what will he do with his mandate? Ashes, you've just come back from India. Tell us how he managed it. Well, first of all, it's a remarkable result because uh, conventional wisdom had it that uh, his party, the BJP, would probably emerge as the largest single party but not win a majority on its own, but it's not only won a majority for the second time, but actually increased its uh, majority. Now, what is uh, quite uh, intriguing is the fact that five years of Modi were at best a mixed result, and more, I would say, failures than successes. On the economy, for instance, today unemployment in India is at a record level. Uh, agrarian distress is unprecedented. The insecurity of people is, again, something which is very worrying. On the external front, relations with Pakistan are at rock bottom. There's tension with China. The special relationship uh, with Nepal has been blown to smithereens. Uh, there's tension because of Modi going and hugging uh, Donald Trump because uh, Russia and China don't like it. So everything put together. It has not been exactly his finest hour in terms and, of and his it performance. Doesn't explain a growing majority. And, and yet, he's won. And he's won because I think this is a march towards majoritarianism in India. And what do you mean by majoritarianism? What I mean is that it is an imposition of Hinduism on the nation. And uh, this was coming in a way, and this is the second term, and it will be reinforced during this second term of five years. India was founded as a secular re republic. So it's a significant departure from the path that India's founders and India's constitution had laid out. Is there any talk about changing the constitution? Or is this more of a, almost like a cultural uh, majoritarianism that you're talking about? In terms of changing the constitution, mm -hmm. it's not in BJP's manifesto. But this has been their proclaimed objective all along. Janet, what do you think? It's, it's interesting, this development of ethnic identity or religious identity, which we're seeing in an awful lot of established democracies in the world. And that it's conceivable that this isn't, it isn't a coincidence that India has been emerging, an emerging economy, emerging into the world economy. And the globalization of the economy, and particularly the globalization of labor, seems to have created a sense of threat that causes people, perhaps quite justifiably in many cases, which causes people to cling to or adhere to or revert to a strong sense of ethnic or cultural identity. The sense that mm. you're being homogenized into a global economy seems to be threatening an awful lot of what we thought of as stable democracies. Nabila, does it's, that resonate with you, that, that explanation for this otherwise rather inexplicable result? Well, I think, you know, the scale of uh, Modi's victory um, you know, gives him a chance to push through uh, radical uh, reforms. But I think that it also might suggest that uh, his poor record has actually been sanctioned and uh, that he'll just go back to looking after his own uh, interest groups. And he's tried to project himself as the underdog uh, fighting the status quo, but he's clearly principally in the hands of big business. And the reality is that India remains uh, a scandalously uh, in unequal society. Like Donald Trump? Um, <laughs> absolutely. Why? While elite groups benefit from the economy and meanwhile millions of people uh, remain uh, excluded but I think you know the the exercise of democracy uh, um, is a massive subject in Britain at the moment as we know but in terms of voting nothing compares to an Indian election uh, some 600 million people took part in the poll um, um, which, um, which saw uh, Modi re-elected and uh, with a landslide but I fear that it's built on 
a particularly disturbing populism rather than success. And he has cultivated the uh, American style success story that of a poor boy who sold tea in a but railway the elites, station. The elites were, were in a way rejected. Right. I mean, be, by, because didn't the Gandhi sort of represent this sort of Anglophone, Congress westernized Party. elites? And that's what's interesting about this. It, I think it would be fair to say the liberals reject uh, Modi. But what has happened uh, successfully for the BJP is a consolidation of the Hindu vote mm. and which was previously splintered. And this Consolidation is aimed against minorities, particularly Muslims. And that's, yeah, the yeah. Form, sorry, that's the form that it happens to take there. The point is that decrying populism is all well and good if you're a smug liberal. But the point is you have to understand why this is happening. Mm. Why is there so much alienation, so much dissatisfaction? Is there a feeling that there is a cosmopolitan liberal elite effectively running the world? Um, you know, and, that, and that your cultural identity is where you retreat to. To a certain extent, it's a vote against the grand old party, the Congress party. So people were fed up with the Congress five years ago, and they haven't quite moved away from that as yet. Although the Congress did offer social justice in their manifesto much more than the BJP manifesto did. So um, in a way, it's a, a baffling result. But then it's reality, it's democracy. You come back to the points that we've been hearing about, um, about, about an elite. Is the Hinduism of um, the message from Modi an opportunity to uh, push the elite together with the dispossessed in, in, in a way that defeats the message of the dispossessed alone? What has happened is this. Hindu big business have backed Modi. But the middle classes have also rallied behind the BJP. The poor are divided. And in a first-past-the-post system, you get 33% or one-third of the votes, and yet you get uh, a handsome majority, which is exactly what's happened in this case. Uh, and it happened last time, too. The BJP vote has gone, gone up a little bit, but not uh, hugely. But uh, in a multi-cornered contest, where uh, you, know, you get 33% is good enough to win. It seems like the tone that he set in his first term was was something that the people many people obviously liked but now he's got to do more than that right he has there has there has to be economic progress there has to be fiscal reform financial reform and among the banks he, he has said he's going to deliver some of them i mean is it a fair message to say five years is not long enough for me to deliver my program i need a second term i wonder about the thing you know he did his big radical reform was the currency right I mean, which which kind of backfired. I mean, indeed, the indeed. cash, the idea that that cash the demonetization, was demonetization. Mm -hmm. yes. Right. Uh, you know, very interestingly, he won his first term on a promise of development. Now, development he failed to deliver. So when it came to this campaign, he went for hardcore Hinduism, and that was the message. And then there was this uh, conflict with Pakistan, and which played out favorably for him. And though though it uh, otherwise failed uh, in terms of his reforms, uh, his uh, efforts, um, I think in the end, this emphasis on ultra nationalism yeah. has paid yeah. off for him. Let's look at the um, international dimension. The Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, has congratulated Modi on his win. He said he hoped to work together for peace, progress and prosperity. Is that realistic? Well, first of all, uh, Imran Khan's own situation is not as secure as people would make, out to, make it out to be. Uh, the army is always the boss uh, in Pakistan, and, and therefore his powers are limited. Having said that, I think the two countries are poles apart in terms of agreeing on a contentious issue like uh, Kashmir. And uh, that being the case, a deal is not easy. And you've got two extremist forces uh, ranged against each other. other. One is the Hindu right, uh, which is represented by Modi, and you've got the army on the other side. So two hardliners, it won't be easy to come together. But I think they, there could be movement. The last five years have been a catastrophic failure in terms of relations between the two countries. They've gone from bad to worse. So it can be res rescued. I think um, uh, confidence building measures can take place and that could make a difference. But I do not see a sea change in the relationship. Nabila, the international dimension, India as a, as a would-be world power, stuck between China and the United States we mentioned a moment ago. 
Well, you know, I think this new exciting India that he's been promising uh, hasn't uh, emerged at all. Uh, instead, uh, unemployment remains sky high, though Singapore-style uh, smart cities haven't materialized, and pollution remains scandalous. But meanwhile, he has been pushing for uh, Hindu supremacism in a manner that has been quite terrifying. Uh, in the early 2000s, he's been um, viewed as an international pariah. Um, because he has been stirring up anti-Muslim riots, which led to uh, the massacre uh, so of, of Muslims. So there was a 2002 massacre where people felt he did not do enough as chief minister of Gujarat to... But this played, I mean, those um, pogroms were condemned uh, everywhere, but in a Hindu-majority country, he played on the notoriety, and dare I say, he was straight out of the Trump uh, handbook, mm -hmm. where he played on people's prejudices rather than their decency. But Trump Janet. actually, I, I, I absolutely loathe Donald Trump, but I mean, he's delivered on some of the things that he said he was going to deliver on cussing taxes and so on, although the ta that has benefited the wealthy much more than the, the middle classes that he always talks about. But it is an interesting parallel because the rhetoric is aimed at what we would call the respectable working class and what America calls the middle class. But in fact, most of the advantages have gone to the wealthiest. But in a very, very hard line capitalist society, that actually does, you know, if, if the wealthy invest more, if business is allowed to be less regulated and more profitable, that actually does help most of the population. But the, it's bizarre to have a leader who is so successful in an election when he's delivered so little. That must mean that the ethnic identity, the cultural identity issue is overwhelming every other consideration. And, and um, Stryker, just a, one last question again mm. on, this, on, on India's role globally, because, I mean, you did hear from some of the voters during the election campaign that Modi has enabled us to hold our head high, to be a, a, a world power. I mean, just in terms of where India fits on the map now, uh, given what we've heard about the, the, the kind of unimpressive performance economically, where will the next five years see India under Modi? Well, it feels like India, like many countries, is, is kind of turning inward in a way at a, at a time at a time when globalization has supposedly spread but is now retrenching and there's there's all this reaction against globalization it seems like he has so much work to do at home that i don't know barring some um, improvement with the relationship with pakistan which would be very important i i i would think he's just tied down at home and mm -hmm. and really unable to to, to do much on the world stage. But I think his whole, the whole project of democracy is being undermined in a bid to turn India into a Hindu nation, and that's mm. the, the crux of the matter. I think there's another factor here. Just quickly. Which is this, that uh, the president. Indian electorate <laughs> generally give a government a second term, and this is his second term. If he fails this time, I think it'll be difficult to get re-elected. And you don't have term limits? No. Well, right? five years. No, no, I'm no, sorry. Uh, no, 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 there are no, no, there are no limits. No, no, yeah. no limits. No. Yeah. We will watch. Um, now, moving on, though, because we leave on October the 31st, deal or no deal, so said Boris Johnson, within hours of Theresa May's departure speech in Downing Street. But we've all heard promises about delivering Brexit before, and Boris Johnson can only deliver his if he wins the Conservative Party leadership contest, in which favourites do risk falling victim, as we know, to the circular firing squad. Janet. Front runner almost never wins <clears throat> in a notorious leadership campaign. But the, the issue about no deal, there's a real misunderstanding about this. No deal isn't a threat. It's what happens if you get to the end of the deadline and you haven't got a deal. It's like you can't take it off the table. It's like trying to take running out of petrol off the table. If you forget to fill the car, you run out of petrol. Now, it, the last time it didn't happen, we got to the deadline, we didn't have a deal, and we didn't come out with no deal because the EU gave us an extension. Macron is absolutely adamant now that there will be no further extension. So by default, we come out with no deal. So Running out of petrol is bad. Yeah, yeah. By the way, no, no, just... no. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm saying <laughs> yeah. the inevitability. If you don't yeah. do something, this is what happens. Now the question is whether the heads of European states are prepared to risk that because it will be very disruptive. Although they are trying to put a brave face on it, it will be very disruptive to the economies of many of the European states, particularly Germany. Um, and the consequence of that is that they would have to go 
go back to their populations and explain why they weren't prepared to make the concessions that would have prevented no deal. That's the political reality. Are they going to be prepared to do that? If they think they have a leader who is not a British leader, who is not going to concede pretty much everything they want, which I'm afraid to say is what Theresa May did, um, then they might just panic and say, now wait a minute, uh, we don't really want no deal. We don't really want to fall off the cliff, uh, even though I personally think that the people who have been so effective at preventing this from happening at all would also be that the business interest, that the geopolitical interest, would find a way around the no deal problem without really any significant difficulty. Within six months, everybody will have to do business and this would be sorted. Nonetheless, these European heads of state would have to go back to their populations and explain why they allowed no deal to happen. Uh, so, so um, Stryker, you first. Uh, um, only way to get a good deal is to prepare for no deal, says Boris Johnson. Do you buy that argument and Janet's argument? That's my argument. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have to. Look, this, this country and, and, and <clears throat> by default, Europe, are, they're really suffering because of what's going on. Everybody is. The UK economy is suffering. The UK... Do you think? Of course it is. Come on, I don't want oh, to deal with the... But with some of these questions want, we've been around yeah, for quite a few times. times. So, so let's just deal with... Do you think that it is a good strategy for each of the Conservative Party candidates to take this line at this point? The line that, that you have to prepare for no deal? In order to get a good deal. That you have to go sure. back to the game of chicken. To. Yes, I, yeah, I think that. so. I think so. The game of chicken again. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think you just have to. It's, it's, it, you, you have to be prepared, and you sure. have to say that. And I, I mean, otherwise, you, you have to, to accept it. whatever they offer. You wouldn't go behind so, a house okay, like so that. So I'm going to. So Anne, do you think the EU will, at that point, blink, or will Boris Johnson or one of the other ca candidates, whoever ends up being the Conservative, but who's going, who is going to blink? Or do you agree with Janet that a deal will be done? you know, on those terms if you disable the steering and hold your eyes open? Look, I wish I knew. The fact is we don't know, and these things are very unpredictable. Europe could blink. Europe could also say, look, we've had it. Yeah, fine. And, and just fine. go. Well, fine. I, yeah. I would suggest <laughs> that the less conciliatory Boris Johnson uh, will now become Conservative leader and then will be torturously close to the dreaded no deal, uh, which actually very few people want uh, in the end. But oh, even no deal is a deceit, uh, because all it will mean is that Britain will create the illusion of a EU free year dot from, which it will, from where it will start renegotiating its deal with Europe. So the, the whole thing is a farce, I'm afraid to say. And Mrs May is simply the latest fall guy uh, in, in the whole farce, and there will be many more. But uh, Ashish, well, how do you see it? I mean, you've just been looking at Well, first at of all, I think Boris Johnson's statement uh, that uh, Britain will quit uh, the EU on the 31st of October, deal or no deal, is predictable yeah. because the rank and file of the Conservative Party would like to hear that. And uh, he has to appeal to the rank and file in order to win. Now, he could be more pragmatic if he becomes Prime Minister. On the other hand, it's still an uphill climb. It's been an uphill climb for three years, and uh, there's been no solution. And Parliament is divided. So, therefore, it's not going to be an easy ride. I personally feel that um, a no deal will be disruptive. In the end, of course, people will come to terms with it. Yeah. But then it could be 10 years from now. I don't think it'll be six months. I think it will be a far longer period of disruption, uncertainty, and it's something that businesses don't want. Um, Janet, we haven't so far. We haven't um, discussed the other candidates. So, is this are, are these um, decisions going to be for Boris Johnson to take in your view, or are we going to see the circular firing squad no, in, there in operation? No, there is a circular firing squad because the party has come too close to the edge of the cliff to do that. They, they've got enough sense not to do that. This plethora of candidates is a bit mythical. A lot of the people who are putting themselves forward as leadership candidates are really just laying down a marker because they want to f for the future and also because they want to be included in a cabinet, uh, there are three or four really serious people who are running for the leadership. And it's going to be a combination of two of them. There's going to be a team effort here. There's going to be a, a kind of dream ticket attempt, you know, with a prime minister and a chancellor. And that will be the interesting thing, is the combination. And what um, will be the combination, in your view? Of people? Oh, yeah. I'm not going to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'm not you know, say. Sorry. Ashish mentioned pragmatism. And I think one of the things that's going to happen
happen is once the leadership race is over, pragmatism is going to have to set in. The new leader, the new prime minister, is going to come under some of the same pressures that Theresa May was under, but probably even more so from the business establishment, for oh, yeah. example. The establishment they will, huge, they are yes. going to come down yeah. so hard on the next on the yeah. next prime minister that that that's going to be a really interesting. Yeah. Now we know what we already know. I think what Boris thought at one point about business, which we cannot repeat <laughs> what on he this meant program. Was, what he I mean. think, I mean, I've known him for 20 years, so I'll give a punt here. He meant stop allowing business to run the show because there are other concerns, there are other interests. What's mystifying in this is why Labour should be so content to allow business to run the show. And of course, they're not. They're divided yeah, over this. Divided. But um, the idea that, for example, that Labour should be in favour of free movement of people. Now, free movement of people means importing unemployed people from poor countries to provide cheap labor in rich countries. How can a party that says it's socialist possibly approve of such a thing? They're very, very confused, Labour, and that's an advantage for the Tories for all their problems. Nabila. Well, I, I think personally that uh, Mrs May's mini emotional breakdown at the end of her resignation speech says absolutely everything about the state of, of British politics. Uh, here was a successor of Winston Churchill bursting with a very un-British um, display of emotion because Brit Brexit wasn't working. And I thought that at one stage she was going to slam the door of number 10 behind her like a petulant uh, teenager. <laughs> and in fact, you know, this is a self-styled um, public servant who three years ago claimed that she could take Britain out of the EU um, in an orderly and a smooth fashion. And she spent all her time since proving that she couldn't, mm -hmm. and this will be her legacy. And I'm afraid that the situation will get even less smooth and even less orderly. And May has effectively come to personify a terrifying stalemate, which will grow far more extreme mm -hmm. and will drive even more uh, nominally you know, refined um, public servants, uh, you know, to... Um, to tears. Sorry, Janet, hold on a minute. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, if, if I may make a couple of points. One is, it's a great pity that the civil war of the Conservative Party has been imposed on the country. Now, it is true that Theresa May was dealt an unkind hand, but the mistake that she made was to treat this as a negotiation b between the Conservative Party and the European Union. She should have treated it as a negotiation between Britain and the European Union. In other words, from day one, it should have been an all-party committee negotiating the exit, uh, as had been uh, mandated by the people. With a Marxist so, Labour Party so let's not go back to, itself. Let's not go back to the, to the fight the battles of the past, right. but looking to the future, I mean, she did say in her parting words yesterday, uh, or Friday, that um, compromise would be necessary. Others have said the problem was she lacked the political skill. Is it a difficult hand that somebody else can play successfully, or is it just a difficult hand that is set for failure? No, Janet? it's not set for failure. Compromise, she did huge amounts of compromise, but only in one direction. She compromised enormously to EU demands, repeatedly. And the EU got very accustomed to that, and they were very happy to accept all her compromises. Now, if there is to be compromise, it has to go two ways, if it's to mean anything at all. But she was also looking over her shoulder at the fundamentalists in her own she party. She wasn't even talking to her own party. She wasn't talking to her own cabinet. She was running this with a, a clique of people who are entirely Europeanized in the Foreign uh, Office and in the Treasury. Stryker, is this a hand that can be Is this a hand that can be played to victory? At this point, played to 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 a win at this point. What's, or a, the, what's the, a win? The, the, yeah, what's, a, what's yeah. well? Yeah. What is yeah. what's your version of a win? What is the way out for the next leader of the Conservative Party? Well, I'm not. I'm really not sure. I don't. I personality can make can make a big difference. Yes, but I'm not sure it can make a big enough difference. I think, you know, and barring a general election. Uh, we're headed for a no deal. We're, there's just, I don't see any other way. And obviously we, we all disagree about whether a no, no deal is a good deal or a bad deal. And that's gonna, we'll be, 
We'll be arguing about that probably in October and maybe six months after or maybe 10 years after. Does anyone disagree <laughs> with that proposition? Well, I think what? whoever comes next has to acknowledge that Britain simply cannot cut all ties with the EU and concentrate on trade deals uh, thousands of miles Nobody away from its closest neighbours. What about the proposition but that barring um, um, a general election, we're headed for a no deal in the UK? Well, you know, I think May understood that the, she, she, she effectively was put in the awkward position where she had to play along with the ridiculous deceit that leave means no, no, we leave. We don't have time for that. Barring a general election, are we headed for a no deal on October the 31st? Well, I think a general election would be welcome to settle differences. I think victory would be a seamless, frictionless transition to a trading arrangement for both sides. And that's what, was, that's what everybody has said they wanted. And that's Except exactly that, what... But the EU, no, 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 the EU wants to punish us. The EU wants to make an example. Any country that left with a good deal would set a model for all those other European countries that might think, hey, that's a good idea, let's no, but try I, it. I don't think the EU can give Britain an easy ride. And but after, then the EU project breaks up. Yeah. Yeah. And after this weekend, <laughs> there will be... Um, proceedings towards a new EU, at least in some respects. So we will be able to discuss that in future. Thank you all for coming in today. And that's it for Dateline London for this week. We are back next week, same place, same time. Goodbye.